All right, gang, let's get started. Good morning, good morning. If you're just joining us, I'm uh, happy to be here with you. Uh, this is going to be a great conversation. I think it's uh, one of the most important conversations that we can have. It's really about the thoughts that we, that we countenance, the things that we focus on on a daily basis. I believe that what we focus on, we get. Uh, life has proven that to me over and over again, both in positive ways and in negative ways. But, you know, I, I guess the way I want to start is this. You know, I'm noticing that uh, within the company, both Utah and California, there are agents amongst us, your peers, who are having the best year of their life so far. In, the, in their business of real estate, in their, their career. And I guess the question that it raises is, how is it possible that people are having their best year that they've ever had in real estate, given what's going on with the pandemic specifically and the restrictions that that's put on, but then also the economic impact that that's had, you know, with people losing their jobs or being furloughed, um, inventories as low as they are. And then of course, what it does to people psychologically in terms of their confidence to go out and make big purchases. And yet we're finding that agents within the company and quite frankly, in the industry, you know, are not only surviving, but they're thriving. And, and the question that, that it raises is why, you know, it's, I guess the answer is this, imagine that you see a car accident on your way to the office and so you stop because you witnessed it and the police officer arrives who's going to take the report and he asks you and many other people who saw the accident to give their perspective. And what is interesting is that the officer is likely if he interviews three or four people will likely get three or four different answers or perspectives on what happened and it won't be the same story. In fact, one story may be that car A ran the, the red light, and the next story could be that car B ran the red light. In other words, they all see the same accident, but they don't see the same accident, if you understand what I mean. In other words, it's really, it's about perspective. What does that have to do with, I think the, the best way to describe it is we, it's called confirmation bias. We're all looking for, it's a scientific uh, phrase, confirmation bias. It's where people will look for evidence to confirm their predispositions or the things that they already believe. See, we want to find evidence. And a great example of that is this, a, a very basic example of it is this. Have you ever thought about buying a car and you start to do your research on it and you, you single your choice down to one or two cars? And before you purchase that car, as you're driving around, going around your normal daily life, you start to see that car or those cars. Or maybe you purchased an article of clothing and then you start to look around and you start to see a lot of people wearing that article of clothing, that particular jacket or particular pair of shoes or brand, whatever it is. See, it's not that people all of a sudden started to buy that car, more of those started to appear literally, or that more people started to buy those shoes or that jacket, they were already there, but you just weren't looking for those things. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. Go back to the auto accident example. See, we all look for evidence to confirm what we already believe. So I, the question I have for you is this, what do you think is the single most important determinant, the single most important factor to our success? Just want you to think about that for a second. Slow down and be reflective. What do you think is the most important determinant to your success? And I've given you pl plenty of hints in this conversation that we've had over the last three or four minutes. The answer that I know emphatically without any sort of reservation is it's our, it's our principles, our philosophies and standards, the things that we really focus on. See, I believe that our principles, our philosophy, our, our standards are really thoughts, thoughts that become our rules, and, and that creates our perspective. Just as we have a perspective of uh, an auto accident or anything else that we see during the course of the day, and then we construct a story around that thing, whether it's a pandemic or an economic downturn or the competition doing crazy things like giving away their commissions just to get business, whatever it is, we have our 
principles, our philosophies, and our standards that we create through which we perceive the world. It creates our perspective, and therefore, as a result, it dictates the way in which we respond. You know, if you think about it, just a great example is LeBron James. If I were to ask you, relative to his principles, philosophies, and standards, would you say that they are good principles and philosophies and standards as it relates to success in basketball, or are they poor principles, philosophies, and standards? And of course, the obvious answer is that they're exceptional principles and philosophies and standards because he's a champion. The guy performs exceptionally well, in addition to the fact that he's paid millions of dollars a year to do that. I mean, it's obvious, it's self-evident that this guy has some pretty amazing principles and philosophies and standards that pay off well for him. Think about Jeff uh, Bezos and Amazon. When he created that company out of his garage back in, I think, 1999, 21 years ago, you know, he had a particular set of principles and philosophies and standards that were different than the principles and philosophies and standards of, say, a Kmart. Those of you who remember Kmart, right? Sam Walton. In his day, he came in and had a different set of philosophy, standards, and principles that changed forever the way retail was actually done. I mean, I would, I would argue that it was, in fact, Sam Walton and Walmart that put many big box uh, chains, retail stores out of business, including Kmart. And then to watch what Jeff Bezos is doing to retail and the impact that that's having on the Targets, the Walmarts, and others, and how they're having to change their approach in order to survive and ultimately, they hope, to thrive. You look at Elon Musk. Is that guy not, in terms of his principles and philosophies and standards and the way in which a car should be built, are his principles and philosophies and standards not, not different? And of course, the answer is they are. In fact, if we look at it, based upon the progress that he's made and the direction that we see the future of car manufacturing going, it seems like he's got the right principles and philosophies and standards. So my question for you is this, is do you have the right principles and philosophies and standards so that you too can be counted amongst the LeBron Jameses, the Jeff Bezoses, the Sam Waltons, the Elon Musks and others, or you take a look at the uh, top producers within this company, you know, the, the Tina Harris, the Dave Parkers, the Justin Udys, the Kathleen Brunos, and others. There are many. See, I, I think one of the most important things that we can do is at times slow down and ask ourselves some pretty important, simple, but important questions. Are my principles and philosophies and standards in alignment with what I say that I want? Am I going to get what I say that I want by following my standards? And remember, the principle key here is this. This is the crux of it. Your principles and philosophy and standards aren't what you say they are, they're rather what you do. Now, many years ago when Everest uh, was created, one of the things that we did, George and I and Rob in Utah, and have continued to do since then, is to ask the question, what is our principles, our philosophies, and our standards, and really enumerate those things, write those things down. So for example, the uh, the affirmations that we go through every morning here. If you look at that, really, if you look at it, as I pull this placard up and I look at it, each one of those is a principle, a philosophy, and a standard, right? It's what it is. They're really the philosophies, the principles, and the standards of Everest. They're the things that we strive to do every day. It's not that we're perfect at it. None of us is, right? But we at least acknowledge and say, these are the things that we're going to conduct ourselves by, that these are the rules. These are the things that are going to direct us on a daily basis in terms of the way we should approach life and the business. So one of the things that we used to do uh, with um, Morning Ascent um, when it was live in person and, uh, and we had the time to do it where it was easier to keep your attention, uh, one of the things that we would do, we would go through what's called the 12 steps to the summit of success. And I'm looking at it right now. Let me just show it to you here. If you can see that, I can find the uh, camera here. It's not going to show it because it's not me and I guess it blanks it out. But it looks no different than the printout that you have or the placard, if you have it, of the, uh, of the affirmations. But it reads at top, the 12 steps to the summit of success. You know, as I look at this, thank, thank you, uh, 
Russ. He's trying to pull that up. There it is. So you can see it. Look at that. I want to go through this with you this morning. And as we go through this, what I want you to do is, is, is ask yourself this question. Do you believe in that principle or that philosophy, that standard, as we go through these? For example, let's start with the first one here. Number one, I dedicate one hour daily towards building and protecting my self-confidence. Now, my question is, do you believe in the importance of doing that, of spending one hour daily towards building and protecting my self-confidence? See, what I want you to do is I want you to acknowledge that statement. I dedicate one hour daily towards building and protecting my self-confidence. If you don't have this in front of you, I encourage you to write it down. To write down the words, I dedicate one hour daily towards building and protecting my self-confidence. And then answering the question, do I believe that that is important? Is that my philosophy? Or do I think that's nonsense? It's not necessary. What is your philosophy? See, my philosophy is that that's absolutely important. I dedicate one hour daily towards building and protecting my self-confidence. In fact, I believe that's a bare minimum. I think that we, quite frankly, need to spend more time every day doing that than just an hour. So my question is, the next question is this, are, if it is your uh, philosophy, if it is your principle, if that is your standard, are you doing it every single day? Are you taking it seriously, that statement that I will dedicate one hour daily towards building and protecting my self-confidence. Guys and gals, what I know is this. There, there's so much stimuli out there from what we read, watch, what we hear other people say, the experiences that we have, the people we come across and their negative attitudes, all the negativity that is, that is offered up to us like a smorgasbord every single day that has a very negative impact on us that we don't recognize on a conscious level. But I'm telling you, it has an impact on us on a very deep, dangerous subconscious level see and if you're not taking a conscious recognition that that's happening and you're not dedicating time every day to stand athwart that to stand against it to say i resist that i'm not going to allow myself to be affected to be dictated to be created to be formed by those things then you will be because you're going to be formed one way or another you're going to be formed by your principles your philosophy and standards and again those things aren't what we say they are, they're what we do. So are you doing that on a daily basis? Are you reading, are you watching, are you listening to things that are positive, that build you up mentally, emotionally? Are you engaged in activities that build you up mentally and emotionally and physically? Are you associating with the right people, participating in things that allow you to learn and to grow consistently? That's the key, to do it consistently. The next thing on this list is this. I practice and internalize my sales skills for a minimum of one hour each day. Listen to that. I practice and internalize my sales skills for a minimum of one hour each day. You know, I can't remember what book it is. I think it's uh, Simon Sinek's, it may be Tipping Point. I don't remember. But he talks about the 10,000 hour rule. That in order to become a master at anything, you really have to work at it for about 10,000 hours. And there are very few people in the world who can say that they've worked at something for 10,000 hours. But a great example of that is Yo-Yo Ma. If you don't know who he is, he's a, uh, a world-renowned uh, cello virtuoso. And he's a guy who is, has, has admitted, has said that he has played and practiced the cello for over 10,000 hours. Well, that's not a surprise. It's not a surprise because if you listen to Yo-Yo Ma, you watch Yo-Yo Ma perform, you look at the crowds to which he performs, it's evident that this guy has practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. See, guys and gals, the cool thing about your sales skills, that ultimately, really, they have nothing to do with the way in which you were born or your innate skills, the gifts that God granted you. It has so little to do with that and more to do with your conscious recognition that it is a skill. See, it's not called an innate ability. I practice and internalize my innate ability to uh, sell people on me and my services. It's I practice and internalize my sell skills. They're skills. And if it's a skill, it's something that you can practice, that you can study, that you can learn, that you can increase your perspective on and as a result, get better at it. But are you taking the time? I, I talked about this yesterday in the, uh, the coaching call. I asked this question, are you obsessed? with figuring things out. 
See, I believe if you're going to become a great salesperson, which you all are, whether you want to admit it or not, because when you're in, in real estate, you're in sales. So that's the first step. Recognize that you are a salesperson. And as such, are you doing what it takes to become a better salesperson? You know, as much as people want to say that they're not in sales because all the negative connotations that come with it, I just want to challenge you to think about all the things in your life that have come to you because of a great salesman or a great saleswoman. The fact that you're alive is self-evident that this concept is true. Your father sold your mother on why she should marry him and vice versa, right? Everything that we enjoy that is good in our lives have come from some sort of sales process. See, if you want to be more successful in real estate, if you want to be able to succeed, regardless of what's going on, on out there, pandemic, one of the worst economies in the last you know, 50 years, self-imposed, but still one of the worst. Look at the unemployment rate on a national level. Some horrible circumstances. A lot of people would commiserate with you and say, you know what, I get it, and it's, I understand, and you know, it's just it's not your fault. Well, you know what? This isn't about fault. This is about what are you going to do? Are you going to find the solutions to the challenge so that you can be counted amongst those who are having the best year that they've ever had in the business? And I'm talking about people who've been in the business for decades and are having their best year ever. See, that's possible. But you have to recognize what the most effective and the right standards, philosophies, and principles are. I practice and internalize my sales skills for a minimum one, one, one hour each day. Are you practicing your listing presentation, how to communicate with people? Are you reading books on communication? Are you volunteering to go out and speaking to people? You might say, well, I don't want to be a public speaker. I can tell you this. One of the most important things that I ever did to increase my ability to improve my listing presentation or my buyer broker presentation or any other presentation that I give in life was to go out and actually practice public speaking. How many of you are part of uh, Toastmasters? See, I, I can't imagine being a real estate sales professional and not being a member of your local chapter of that organization. Because see, guys and gals, you're not in the business of selling real estate. You're in the business of communicating. And the sooner you figure that out and recognize that and work on that particular skill, the sooner you will be able to, regardless of what's going on in the marketplace, not only survive, but thrive. The next standard is this. I contact my sphere of influence, my SOI, by mail, by phone, and or in person, and by email quarterly. I'm going to read that again. I contact my SOI by mail, by phone, and or in person, by email quarterly. See, I believe that one of the easiest ways to exist in this business long term, at any level that we want to, 12 homes, 24, 48, 100, 200, 300, 400, is to make certain we recognize the importance of our sphere of influence. I watch agents who for decades have been in the business and don't have a set of standards or a protocol dealing with their sphere of influence. Like, for example, what I read here. I contact my sphere of influence by mail, by phone, and or in person, and by email quarterly. They've been in the business for decades and they're not doing that. Or they may be doing it, but not doing it consistently. See, guys and gals, I would prefer to have a business in real estate that is built upon dealing with people I already know, because I don't have to worry about building their sense of confidence in me. I don't have to get them to like me or to trust me. They already do. These are people who are in my sphere of influence. It's not my sphere of haters. It's my sphere of influence. But I watch people ignore the group of people. And then they will go out and try to create relationships with people they don't know and then say that real estate's a tough business. Well, it is when you've got the wrong principles and philosophies and standards. Do not ignore the people you know. Pay attention to the people that you know, your past clients, your neighbors, people in your church group, civic groups. Pay attention to the people who know you and they'll pay attention to you, but you have to do it consistently. Do you have a set of principles and philosophies and standards that you, that you execute on every single day as it relates to your sphere of influence? Number four, I make 150 plus contacts per week, 30 plus a day by phone or in person. For most real estate agents, I can tell you that's the scariest thing. To hear, for example, 150 contacts per week, how is that even possible? You're telling me that I could talk to 
30 people or that I have to every single day in order to be successful in real estate? Well, first of all, let me answer those in turn. I'm telling you, you should. Do you have to? No, you don't have to do anything. But if you want to sell more real estate, yes. The more you, the more you want to sell, the more you got to talk and the more people you have to talk to. Not just the same people every day. You got to talk to new people because this is not a business about real estate. It's a business about people. We have to expand our sphere. So talking to new people, 150 plus contacts per week, 30 plus per day by phone or in person. See, the only way ultimately to increase your sphere of influence is to take the people you don't know and, and turn them into people you do know, turn them into people who know you. But that's not going to happen by you just standing there and waiting for people to reach out to you. I mean, think about it. In the last 12 months, how many people have called you out of the blue that you did not know and said, I want you to come over and list my home? I'm not talking about people who were referred to you by somebody you already know. I'm talking about a complete stranger picks up their phone and calls you and says, I don't know you, you don't know me, but I want you to come over and sell my home. And my suspicion is it didn't happen. And if it did, it's certainly not a, a reliable a business philosophy. It's not gonna keep you in business. Are you recognizing the importance of contacting new people every single day? That is going to be ultimately the wellspring or the fountainhead. It's going to be the primary resource for growing your business long term. Because your sphere of influence over time will have a tendency to contract. It's like a pond. A pond will eventually evaporate because the sun's uh, heat, right? So therefore, it has to have some sort of tributary, something that that contributes to it so that it doesn't dissipate. Well, for a lot of real estate agents, their sphere is dissipating because they're not spending the time every day to contact new people to expand their sphere. The next one here, number five, I follow up with all of my qualified leads daily. Let me just say this, because some of these things I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on. There is a distinct difference between lead generation, which was what we were talking about under four. You know, I make 150, 150 plus contacts per week, that's lead generation, trying to find somebody you don't know who wants to buy or sell real estate and get them to become familiar with you, to trust you, to like you, to respect you, so that you can help them buy or sell real estate so that long-term, they're your client and they're in your sphere of influence. That's called lead generation. Step number five, I follow up with all my qualified leads daily. That is something completely different. It's distinctly different. See, follow-up is talking to people you already know to some degree, even if you just talk to them last week in a phone call about buying or selling real estate for the first time. Following up with them is critical. It's not the same thing. So my question for you is, are you on a daily basis distinguishing between those two and making certain that you're spending time doing both? See, well, do you no good to only uh, talk to the people that uh, you know and expect that your business is going to grow long term? It won't. Because as, we, uh, as we've already talked about over time, your sphere of influence is predestined to dissipate, to shrink over time. People die, people move, people choose other agents for all sorts of reasons. Your sphere of influence will shrink, so therefore you've got to engage in activities to increase it. Well, part of that is this, that I'm gonna follow up with all of my qualified leads daily. In other words, to try to build these other relationships, to create other relationships so that I can turn these people into long-term clients. Is that one of your philosophies? Or are you simply waiting for people to reach out to you? You know, you call them once, well, maybe they'll call me back. You know, or you go out and present to them and you say, well, if you have any questions, let me know. And then never follow up with them again. See, it's not their job to follow up with you guys and gals. What is your philosophy and standard? How, what do you rank yourself on these things? Where are you on a scale from one to 10? Do you believe these things that I'm reading here? And are you currently doing them? Number six. I set five plus new appointments per week with buyers or sellers. That's probably the most shocking thing that I'm gonna to read to you uh, this morning, for most agents anyway. The idea that, wait a minute, I set five plus new appointments per week with buyers or sellers? So you're telling me that I need to set an appointment a day? Well, again, no, you don't need to do anything. You don't have to do anything. The question is, what sort of business do you want? If the question is, is it possible to set an appointment today consistently? The answer is, of course, yes, because there are many agents in this company, in your company, your peers, your, your co-professionals who are doing that very thing. I know agents who set more than one appointment a day. They'll set two or three a day, three or four appointments a day. 
one agent doing that, not a team where they combine and say, well, we set, no, one agent who will set one, two, three, four appointments every single day. I watched Alma Merrill several years ago. Well, it was like nine years ago. In the course of an hour and 20 minutes, set nine appointments with four sell by owners. So see, I know that it's possible. I've seen it, I'm seeing it. My question for you is, is that your philosophy? Is that your standard? Is that your principle? Do you wake up every day with the intention, with the focus that I am going to set an appointment today? Now, if you don't set an appointment, is that bad? Well, it's not the outcome we want, but that's okay. Don't beat yourself up. The question is, are you going to show up tomorrow with the same principle, philosophy, and standard and work to set that appointment? See, if that's your principle, if that's your philosophy, and that's your standard, and you execute on it every single day, eventually you'll get your results. See, LeBron James doesn't make the basket every time, but it doesn't mean he stops trying. The fact is, the reason he is a champion is because of that very point. He misses, but he doesn't stop. He keeps practicing. He keeps working at it. He keeps trying. He keeps executing. And that's what makes him a champion. That's what allows him, when all others are failing, to be a champion. That's what allows these agents who are selling more real estate today than they ever have to be a champion. So I set five plus new appointments per week with buyers or sellers. Is that your standard? Number seven, I completely pre-qualify 100% of my appointments. Look, one of the best things that you can do to ensure your chances of success at getting a listing agreement signed or getting a buyer to choose you to sign that buyer broker agreement is this, to pre-qualify 100% of the time. To ask what for a lot of agents are the difficult questions that they don't want to ask because they feel like they're primed or they don't want to know the answer because they're afraid that the client or the potential client is going to give the wrong answers and it will eliminate them from consideration and the agent doesn't have enough business and they don't want to say no to a potential that quite frankly isn't going to buy. See, that is a horrible standard. I'm not going to ask the right questions because I don't really want to know the truth because if I know the truth, what I'll discover is this person really isn't a viable prospect. If they're not a viable prospect, I don't have anything going on. So therefore I have no business. I would sooner acknowledge that they're not a viable candidate and go out and spend time trying to find one than to build my hopes on somebody who is answering the questions in the wrong way or who's, who's never been asked the questions and therefore I don't know. Look, guys and gals, you have to take control of your business. You have to have principles and philosophies and standards that are consistent with the level of success that you say that you want. I completely pre-qualify 100% of my appointments. And we have scripts on these things. If you're saying to me, well, what questions would you ask? Go to your broker manager and say, what are our scripts relative to pre-qualifying for buyers and sellers? Number eight, I have an appointments attended to listings taken ratio of at least 5% or greater. See, is that your standard? Your standard is that when I go out on an appointment with a buyer or a seller, that at least 50% of the time, I get the contract signed. See, again, I believe that we get what we focus on. We get what we say that we want. Higher standards, higher results. Rolls-Royce proves that every single day. You can pay upwards of a half a million dollars or more for a standard, if there is one, standard Rolls-Royce. Your standard Toyota, you might pay about $50,000 for. So you're going to pay 10 times as much for a standard Rolls-Royce versus a standard Toyota. But they're both cars. So what's the difference? Well, it's the standards. Rolls-Royce is built to a different standard. When they build their cars, they build them with higher quality products, with more precision, and ultimately a better product. That's why they charge $500,000. So if you want to get better results, if you want to get more contracts signed when you do go out and present to a buyer or seller, right? Then set the intention that that's what you do and ask questions like, how do I do that? Well, one of the ways you do it is make certain that you are pre-qualifying 100% of the time so that when you do go out, you're already talking to somebody who's motivated, who's ready, willing, and able, now you just have to make certain that they choose you versus the competition. How many times have you gone out on an appointment where you realize that these people aren't serious or they're not capable, they can't sell their home? And you didn't know that until you got there. Because the, the point is you never would have gone there if you knew that in the first place. I'm assuming, I'm hoping, 
Because my question is, why would you be there if you knew you couldn't help them because they weren't capable of actually getting their home sold? Item next here. Number nine, I call all of my sellers weekly and reduce all listings every three weeks a minimum of 5%. You know, historically, that's a big deal. Right now, probably not so much. But if you have a listing in today's market where inventory is as low as it's ever been since I've ever seen it in my 26 years, you have a listing that's not selling. It's not because the listing is missing a feature. It's not because the listing is on a busy street. It's not because the home is nice and you don't know, you can't understand why. That's not the answer. The answer is it is overpriced. So take a look at what it's taking on average for homes in the price range of that particular listing and then compare that to how long your listing's been on the market. And if your listing has been on the market longer than those average days, I can simply tell you without even seeing the home, it's because your home's overpriced, period. It's as simple as that. Is that one of your principles, philosophies, and standards? Uh, next, 10, I sell 75% or more of my listing inventory. See, that's about a standard of, look, I'm not going to take a listing unless I intend to sell it. I think that that number, that's a bare minimum. It should, be, it should essentially be 100%. Notwithstanding if people decide that they're not going to sell because they're not going to move or they worked out the differences or they're not going to get a divorce. There are situations where, okay, you can't control that. But the bottom line is that most of the things that we uh, need to do or that need to be done in order to successfully get a home sold, we have control over setting the right price, doing the right things in terms of the marketing process, you know, going out and prospecting, making certain that as we promote it online, you know, and on the MLS, that it's described accurately and that we use professional photos that show it in its best light. See, all of these things are within our control. And if we're doing those things to the degree that we should, that this number of I sell 75% or more of my listing inventory, that's a bare minimum. You'll exceed that by far. You know, I'm coaching agents where their, their number is 98, 99%. Literally, that's what it is. So 99% of the time when they list a home, they sell it. We talk about a great sound bite. Talk about a great thing to share with your potential clients. Number 11, we're almost done here. We've only got two more. I will return every sign, call, and contact every buyer lead within two hours of inquiry. Guys and gals, if somebody hands you the gift of reaching out to you and you're not available, make certain you get back with them as soon as possible nothing more needs to be said there. It is a gift when people call you because we're not in retail. We are in direct sales and it's our job to reach out to people. So if somebody's reaching out to you, man, get back to them as quickly as possible. This is within two hours. I'm just telling you that, that in today's world with the attention span of the average human being, being about what it is for a goldfish around seven to nine seconds, we need to get back to people quickly. And the fact is that your competition is not waiting two hours to get back to those people because I guarantee you this that person who's calling you is calling other agents about their listings as well and then finally this I only work with hollow qualified buyers who've been pre-qualified with their mortgage lender and have signed a buyer broker agreement look guys and gals if you're going to work with buyers which I'm not suggesting you shouldn't buyers are great they're half the market but if you're going to work with buyers I strongly suggest that you do this that you Work with highly qualified buyers who've been pre-qualified by a mortgage lender and have signed a buyer broker agreement. See, the truth is this, working with a buyer is a lot more expensive. It's more expensive because you spend more time, more energy, more effort getting a home under contract and close working with the buyer than you ever will with the seller. So it's more expensive working with buyers. So if you're going to work with buyers, at least have a set of standards that ensures that it's most likely that they're going to actually buy or sell, or excuse me, buy, but possibly sell as well. See, all of these things that we've gone through here, what we call the 12 steps to the summit of success, they are principles, they are philosophies, and they are standards. Guys and gals, do you have the right principles, the right philosophies, and the right standards that will allow you to not only survive in today's marketplace with what's going on with the pandemic and the economy and the psychology of people, but to thrive. See, I know this. Without some of you I don't know, we've never met or never sat down in a one-on-one -on -one coaching session. Many of you I have. But it doesn't matter. I know that all of you are capable of doing it. The question is, 
Are you going to adopt the right principles, philosophies, and standards? Are you going to execute upon those? Because see, that is the difference between LeBron James and some also ran in the NBA or somebody who never got into the NBA. Because LeBron James has the right principles and philosophies and standards, and he executes on them every single day. Jeff Bezos and Amazon, same thing. Sam Walton, Walmart, same thing. Elon Musk, the same thing. And you think about those people that you look up to who are exceptional at what it is that they do. I guarantee you, it has nothing to do with where they were born, how they were raised, what excuses they did or did not have. It has everything to do with their principles and philosophies and standards and them executing upon those things every single day. That, to me, is great news, because it tells me that it's available to all of us if we just simply choose it. It's a choice, guys and gals, so what do you choose? So let's do this. Let's finish it up with some closing affirmations. I would encourage you to go through this list that we've gone through and really identify, is it my philosophy? Do I believe it? Am I doing it? And if not, improve it. And make certain that you do make these part of what it is that you do. It is not a coincidence that Everest holds the position that it does on a national and international level in terms of production, gross commission incomes paid to agents, and the number of homes sold. It's because of our principles, our philosophies, and our standards.